Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today, The Gateway to Better Network, a UCA member benefit. Our speaker this afternoon is UCA's own CEO, Laurel Steimanoff. Laurel has served as the CEO of the Urgent Care Association since January of 2017, where she is responsible for the implementation of the organization's strategic plan, as well as supporting the board of the Urgent Care Foundation, the College of Urgent Care Medicine, the Urgent Care Services Corporation, the UCA Political Action Committee, and now the Gateway to Better Network. She was the former member of the UCA Board of Directors, a co-chair of the Accreditation and Certification Committee, chair of the Urgent Care Foundation Board of Trustees, chair of the UCA Health and Public Policy Committee, and an accreditation surveyor. Prior to her work at UCA, Laurel was a founder and principal of Continuum Healthcare Solutions, LLC, a consulting company focusing on the urgent care and outpatient rehabilitation industries. She has also served over seven years in executive positions at Next Care Urgent Care, based in Mesa, Arizona, including Executive VP of Development and Principal and Chief Operating Officer. Prior to Next Care, Laurel served in leadership roles as the Senior VP of Development for Comprehensive Medical Imaging, or CMI, a subsidiary of Sycor International, and the president of Matrix Rehabilitation, a division of Beverly Enterprises, a physical therapy and urgent care company with over 180 sites across the country. She has also held multiple executive positions with NovaCare Incorporated, culminating in the position of President of Western Region Outpatient Division, where she oversaw the operation of over 300 outpatient therapy sites. Laurel is a summa cum laude graduate of The Ohio State University School of Allied Medical Professionals with a degree in physical therapy. She is also certified in healthcare compliance through the Healthcare Compliance Association. Laurel is spearheading the Gateway to Better Network, network with experience. She managed a diagnostic imaging network in her role at CMI and also served in a development role for the Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Network as a consultant. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping announcements. If you have any questions during the webinar, you may post them in the question box on your GoToWebinar dashboard. We encourage any and all questions throughout the webinar, and I will come back on at the end of the webinar to pose your questions to Laurel. There is additionally a PDF copy of today's presentation and an FAQ in the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard. Remember that the session is being recorded, so please make sure to mute your phone as all background noise can be picked up. You'll have access to the recordings tomorrow and will receive a separate email from Nicole Van Mersbergen that will provide you with a link to the webinar. That's about all I have. Now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Laurel. Well, thank you, Callie, and, and thank you, everyone, for um, being here today. Um, you know, we as an association know this is a two-way street. You know, we, um, we appreciate our members and other vendors and otherwise, and we also feel that we as an association want to provide value back. And one way that we have identified right now is really by um, this initiative, the Gateway to Better Network, and so I appreciate your being here so we can tell you a little bit more um, about what we think is going to ultimately be of, of real value to the members of the association. So of course, right away, my computer is not moving forward. There we go. So, you know, first, really, what is the network? Um, as Callie said, you know, I've been involved in networks before in the diagnostic imaging world and the physical therapy and rehabilitation outpatient world. Um, and this has always kind of been in the back of my mind as something that we can do. It was just really coming up with what is, what is the right structure and what is the right plan for it. But what the Gateway to Better Network is really a way to aggregate all of the UCA member organizations across the country. Um, you know, UCA markets it, and the goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to bring new patient opportunities to member centers, you know, really pursue different types of non-traditional markets. Um, it is a connector. You know, we don't expect to be adjudicating claims. Um, we, we are going to really allow our network to be uh, leased, essentially, by other organizations. So it's more of a lease relationship. And the relationship of the member center will be, uh, you know, 
through the UCA Gateway to Better Network to that organization. And that is where, if there are payment issues or that type of thing, they are likely to be taking place in that connection. Um, as I said, we are pursuing non-traditional or cutting-edge contracting opportunities. And you know, we have, since I started here in January of 2017, you know, two or three times a year, someone will call and they want access to our members. And we talk to them about how they can, you know, exhibit, which is certainly a good way to um, get to our members. We tell them that, you know, they can advertise in UC Access or, you know, other modes. But it's, it's apparent, I think they really want us to be a little bit more hands-on in terms of how we are um, working with them, essentially, to bring them avenues for patient care. Um, and I think, you know, partly I think the new environment for value-based payment and population health opens the door for non-traditional streams of patients as well. So it really comes down to, you know, why is now the time for the gateway to better network? And I think it's really important, you know, as I've been in this position to see, you know, some of the things that keep me awake at night. Um, you know, we remain relatively fragmented when looking at some of our competition um, or partners, you know, in on-demand medicine. But the top 20 urgent care organizations represent about 20.8% of the entire industry. You know, it, we monitor it every month. We know the industry is now over 9,100 centers across the country. And if you add up all of those top 20 that we keep a list of, you know, it's still a relatively small portion of, of the entire industry. Yet if we look at the top 20 retail clinic organizations, they represent 95% of their industry, of which of that you know, 95%, one player is 55% in the CVS Minute Clinics. So they have you know, a national footprint, the ability to pursue national contracting opportunities, you know, one, one agreement, you know, and you have this national network of contracts or of centers for delivery of care. And now then to add to that, we have CVS and Aetna coming together in a $70 billion acquisition of Aetna by CVS, really to create an entirely new model. And, and they really want um, these health hubs that you see in this picture here to be healthcare destinations. And if you go to one of those health hubs now, you know, you're going to get, uh, you know, a myriad of services that they kind of stay as their one-stop shop. Um, they're, they have now lab uh, wellness rooms. There are pictures of, you know, yoga classes going on, in-person counseling. They have nutritionists that are going to be available to meet, be their other clinicians. Obviously, they have the pharmacy inside. So, you know, they really want those hubs to become healthcare destinations. They're testing them in Texas right now. I really feel like what urgent care has always been able to offer is saying we really are that one-stop shop. You know, you need an x-ray, come here. You need um, uh, lab work. You know, if we don't provide that service on site in terms of the tests that we have, we'll, you know, we'll send your blood out to a lab, but you don't have to go somewhere else. And now they really are, you know, trying to, um, you know, take this to a whole new level. So, you know, there is, you know, there is a different uh, competitor out there that is on the horizon for uh, the traditional urgent care. And then this is from the New England Journal Medicine Catalyst uh, very recently, um, where it said New York Presbyterian Wheel, Cornell Medicine, and Columbia have set forth on a path to be national leaders in telemedicine, another on-demand service that's out there now. Um, and uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Fleischkut, who actually uh, we've reached out to and will be a speaker at our May 2020 convention um, said the days of brick and mortar urgent care are going to go away. The capital expense is just too much and digital medicine is here and it's here to stay. And you know, one of the reasons we invited him is I think it's worthy of a conversation. You know, and this isn't certainly a fear tactic. I don't necessarily agree with um, that bold of a statement, but I do think it's a, you know, one of those wake up calls that says to us, you know, we need to innovate as well. You know, we need to be transformational, um, and, and it's time for us to look at different ways to deliver care. And I, I pose the question, you know, do you suffer from commercial payer dependency? I think this is another issue we have to address. 
In our benchmarking report in 2017, 67% of visits were related to commercial payers. In 2018, we saw that drop considerably to 47%. Um, and we were seeing a shift then to more Medicare, Medicaid, employer services, occupational medicine in the 2018 study or data year. 67% seemed a little high, 47% seemed a little low based on historical benchmarking. It typically has run around 58%, but nevertheless, you know, it tells us that our industry is still very dependent on the commercial payer market. And the American Medical Association repeased, uh, had a report that said 73% of major metropolitan areas have an absence of health insurer competition, meaning we have you know, monopolies, oligopolies, something like that going on in the markets in terms of competition when it comes to the market. And in 91% of metropolitan statistical areas or MSAs, at least one insurer held a commercial market share of 30%. Or in greater than 46% or 175% of those MSAs, one insurer's share was at least 50%. And so when one insurer is 50% of the commercial market, urgent care centers and other providers are vulnerable in these environments, particularly if they're not associated with a major healthcare system that has a lot of contracting clout. So, you know, while the commercial payer will always be an important part, I think, of what urgent care does. And, you know, to the consumer out there who's covered by that type of insurance, I also think, you know, we need to look and innovate and figure out other avenues and perhaps look to ways to decrease that dependency. The AMA also came out with the 10 least competitive markets. Usually in these markets, these states that you see here, there is really one dominant player. So, you know, if you lose the ability to contract with that player, you know, it can be very concerning. And most of the market, it's the blues, but not all. And then there are other commercial insurance challenges that we're hearing up from our members. Uh, global or fixed rates, they really stifle, or, you know, the opportunity to add more services, to be more competitive. If we really are looking in certain markets for emergency department diversion programs, Logically, we would be um, creating an environment in our centers where we can treat perhaps a higher level of acuity patient, whether that's in the tests that we offer. Uh, but when we have global or fixed rates, there is little incentive to do that. In fact, you know, really, it is a disincentive to do that and somewhat concerning in terms of how we're being paid that way. Um, we have see some payers defining what our staffing models have to look like whether you have to have a physician on site at all times, one payer in one market required that you have a board certified emergency department physician on site at all times, which you know, tells me they don't really understand the types of patients who are coming into us, but that was one of their criteria that was pointed out to us. Uh, we see now in plan design, rising co-payments and patient responsibilities and deductibles you know, our position is really we are providing a substantial part of primary care in this country, and it doesn't make sense that we have these um, co-payments that are so different from that of a primary care provider. But nevertheless, you know, we're seeing the $50, $75 co-payments in terms of plan design. And there are clauses limiting the scope of care, usually wellness and follow-up care are the types of things that we see eliminated in traditional contracts. The perception is that all patients have a medical home by many of these groups, and the perception is that all patients have access to their medical home, either via appointments or they're geographically close to their medical home, which we know does not happen. Uh, networks are also closing for new network entrants. So even if someone has an established center of clinics in a market, sometimes we're finding out when they open a new center that they're being closed out, or someone is told that they need to you know, have their CLIA license and a certain number of things before they can even apply for a contract. And then when they do apply for a contract with one of these major players, they're told that the network is now closed. So how can we respond? I think through, you know, as I said, we've seen people uh, adding more workers' compensation and occupational medicine to their practice. They're looking at cash payment programs. One of the most popular webinars and recently 
presentation that was done at, at our convention that was well attended was, you know, how do you set up a medical discount program if that is uh, a legal option for you in your state? We know that the U.S. uninsured rate grew to 13.7% in 2018, despite Medicaid expansion, and cash pay represented 7% of urgent care visits in 2017. So, and this, this doesn't include co-payments or this type of thing. These are patients coming in the door and paying cash for the services because they either are uninsured or underinsured. And then there are new services, whether they're cash pay or traditional. We see travel medicine, aesthetics, uh, greater percentage of urgent cares adding physical therapy. But, you know, I think our message is, you know, let's get disruptive again. When you think about urgent care, it really was disruptive when it began, and it was the catalyst for all of these on other on-demand kind of consumer-driven services that are out there. So we can do some direct-to-employer contracting if you have the geographic capabilities within your market, the contracting capabilities to do that, the administrative capabilities, or we can join together and pursue new innovative opportunities. DocuTap, in their uh, quarterly newsletter that they put out, the Urgent Care Trends to Watch in 2019, they said, one trend we expect to see gain momentum is direct contracting. Through direct contracting, self-insured employers partner with a healthcare system to reimburse provider for services rendered. And this is usually done through AP ACOs, and they're bypassing traditional insurance companies. And then they, we will see an expanded scope was one of their predictions as well, where we'll see um, more primary care providers shift into the on-demand care mode and more urgent care clinics offering services once reserved for family doctors. So a little bit more of the blurring of lines, but as I mentioned earlier, it's hard for many urgent cares to get into some of those services reserved for family doctors um, if because of some of the restraints put into a number of the traditional commercial contracts, which really limit episodic care, no wellness services. And our position is that the urgent care should be able to determine their scope of practice based on their community needs, their capabilities, their scope, not have that limited necessarily by some contractual language. So if you join the UCA Gateway to Better Network, what does that look like? There would, it would start with an organizational contract between the Gateway to Better Network and participating member organizations. We really see this as virtually no risk to the organization. This is a foundational contract that opens the door for other opportunities to hitch their wagon and to lease this network. And then you will have the choice in terms of what you want to accept or not accept out of that market. Once the, that found, or foundational contract between your organization and the Gateway to Better Network is executed, will ask for some additional information, which just has to do with kind of a profile, so that we will want to know about your scope of care, you know, do you have any limitations? For example, if you are a pediatric practice, we don't want to send an injured 40-year-old to your pediatric practice. We want to make sure that when anyone leasing our network has a profile that will allow them to make the choices to get the right patient to the right spot. I'm going to pick up the phone because I'm, I'm being told that I'm cutting out some, so I'm going to pick up the phone receiver, and hopefully that will help. So once we have that, once executed, as I said, we're going to send out that profile. We'll look at hours of oper operation. Um, do you provide occupational medical services? Those types of things. And then we will want a key contact for that organization. Um, we will also have delegated credentialing. So there would be, um, you know, we're, we are saying as opposed to you providing, you know, 50 pages of documents to us in terms of credentialing, the contract will define our expectation and you will, by signing the contract, attest that you are doing those things that are in that contract from a credentialing standpoint. And then we will occasionally do spot audits of organizations to make sure that is actually being done. If you're in UCA accredited centers, you don't even have to worry about a spot audit because we've already been in there essentially as a surveyor um, holding you to a, a higher standard in terms of what your credentialing processes look like. But 
we are essentially saying to you, you know, if you if you participate in the Medicare program, these types of things, and you do these things, we are you are essentially a delegated credentialer. So the process, once again, is UCA will market this Gateway to Better network. We have already started to do so in a press release that went out within the last 10 days. Several people picked up the phone as a result of that. Uh, we will identify viable parties seeking services appropriate for an urgent care center. So I've had conversations with some. We actually have you know, some a contract with one. We're in discussions that uh, look very promising with others. Um, and from you know, but we will weed out those that really aren't necessarily the type of thing that we would offer through a network. We may just bring, you know, directly um, or suggest to them that they reach out to members directly. But UCA then notifies the designated contact within the organization that you've provided for those participating centers and those organizations of that opportunity. You will be presented with a summary of the opportunity, including, you know, billing instructions, payment expectations. Um, you know, one group that we're talking about right now would actually say you really set the rate that you are looking for. So that would be clear. You would need to send back to us, you know, this is what my expectation would be for payment. Um, if there are any nuanced documentation expectations, any nuanced authorization, any other things that might be associated with that so that you can make an informed decision. And if we know it, we'll give expectations for patient volume. So, you know, we might say this is really a Florida regional uh, contract, but, you know, it's associated with teachers and those teachers may be traveling. So we really would like a nationwide network to offer to it, but the expectation for patients is probably really going to be in Florida. And then there would be, if you accept that, then there would be an addendum to the Master Gateway to Better Network Agreement, and that's supplied to you so that, you know, once again, all the details are there. The profile of what you are entering into is there with billing instructions, that type of thing. As I said, we, we won't be adjudicating claims. You're not sending claims to us. It would be through, through whoever is leasing our network. As I said, we already have uh, secured some opportunities. Uh, one example is the Health in Motion Network. Their pursuit is of the, in the industries of transportation and logistics, K through 12. They're looking at campus care at the collegiate level, university level, public health, and self-insurance are the markets that they are going after, um, typically in that self-insured arena. And then we also are working right now with a cash payment organization. They've created a very innovative platform. They're seeking a national network of locations to look for to deliver a cash-only patient to you with lots of innovative ways to do that and capture those patients in from a billing uh, um, respect. But, you know, once again, in that situation, you're not paying for the marketing to get those patients. You're not paying for the billing costs associated with their patients. They're coming in prepared to pay you at your front desk. But ultimately, as I said, the choice is yours. Anytime we present a new opportunity to someone who has signed the master agreement, there would be a 10-day review process for the participating organization. You have the opportunity to opt out if it's not a good fit. If you say, you know, from a payment, from a process, you know, we've had um, organizations approach us to say, you know, we have this IV medication that needs to be delivered on site. Someone needs to monitor it over a four-hour period and take vital signs. You know, is is there um, a market for that? And not everyone wants to do IV um, medication administration or has the capability to that, but someone may have capacity between the hours of, you know, one and five o'clock, and that actually would be a very good thing for them. So they could opt in or opt out of that. And if opting in, then that new agreement becomes an addendum to the overarching Gateway to Better network contract. As I said, you know, we have the delegated credentialing crit criteria. Um, you are attesting that licenses of all of your providers, whether that's a rad tech or a physician, PA and P, are active. They're unencumbered. The organization's in compliance with state regulations for APC oversight as appropriate. No exclusions to participate in the state or federally funded health program. Um, the organization is certified for participation under Medicare and Medicaid if you are a Medicaid provider. 
and there are minimum professional liability insurance of one million per occurrence, three million aggregate. And then we have a number of center or policy specific criteria that you can see here. Pretty, you know, I mean, for urgent care, these are I think pretty standard, you know, visible signage, uh, accessible, um, you know, areas for patients, clean, pre prevent, presentable and professional appearance. You're prohibiting smoking, you have sufficient space. Um, you know, they have active state professional license, as I said, which is unencumbered. You have some type of quality insurance program that includes primary verification of current unencumbered state licenses in your uh, APCs, employed or contracted provider organization. So once again, these things are defined in the contract. Um, you know, if you have questions, once you take a look at it, we're certainly going to be here and able to respond to any of those. So how do you actually participate in the network? It's easy, and we wanted to make the enrollment as easy as possible. So here is our website that you go to, and if you hover here over membership, and then you see over here the Gateway to Better Network, you would click on that. And then you would go to this page that speaks to it. And down here, you see the Join the Gateway to Better Network today. And it takes you to a page that looks like this, where I'm just going to fill in my name, XYZ Urgent Care, LLC. I put that I have four centers. I am the person that is, I can you know, have the authority to sign this participating provider agreement. And it takes you then, you put your title, once again, email address, and then there's a signature spot. But if I take it back here, the important thing to read is right here. This is the actual agreement itself that you would want to click on, run through, make sure that's something you are comfortable agreeing to. But that in and of itself, when you click on the agreement recitals, is the contract. So that really, you know, I want to open it up to questions right now, is the overview of what we are trying to achieve. Um, as I said, I think it is a way to bring non-traditional patients that may appear on the surface to be somewhat traditional because oftentimes the direct-to-employer contracts or the self-insured contracts, there still is a contract administrator that may look like one of your traditional healthcare providers in the market, but this, the Gateway to Better network would be the urgent care network for that particular self-insured. So, I think there are real opportunities here, you know, considering we've done little to no marketing, the phone is ringing because I think a national network of urgent care centers is really a new concept and a new way to compete. So with that, again, I thank you for your time and I open this up for questions. Thank you, Laurel. We do have a few questions that have come in through the um the GoToWebinar um, platform. Just a reminder to all attendees, feel free to go ahead and plug those in now. First question is, does this nullify existing commercial agreements? I think we need to look at it this way. It, you know, if, if you have an agreement with, um, you know, it, it certainly doesn't nullify your agreement with Cigna, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem, whomever you are contracted with in the market. It is, it is not a replacement for this. What we are trying to say is this, our goal is that it would reduce your dependency. We would like to see, you know, some gateway to better network um, as part of the pie chart of, you know, what what is bringing me patients in the future we would like to see this be a part of the pie chart, essentially, that may be reducing your dependency, but I would like to think that we are not replacing what you have existing out of there. We are pursuing, I think, a different type of patient. As I said, one could be the uninsured or the grossly uninsured patient that would come to your door. Or the Health in Motion Network, as I said, you know, they, they go after, for example, the transportation and trucking industry. And these people are obviously displaced from their medical homes for the greater part of any month, and they need care sites across the country. So this would be a way of directing them into your centers versus replacing the existing book of business that you have. 
if something would appear, you know, something would come to you and say, well, I already have those patients, then I think you just opt out and say, you know, I, I have a better uh, contractual agreement this way, or maybe I will opt out of what I currently have because what Gateway to Better can bring me is a better agreement. But I think, you know, in general, we're hoping that this is truly the best of both worlds for you. Okay, the next question, how are the notices of new agreements sent and highlighted so that the urgent care knows that there is a 10-day response time? This would come directly to that contact person, which is why it is important and why we want to give 10 days thinking, okay, most people, you know, unless they want to let us know, I'm going to be gone for longer than 10 days. Um, you know, most people, their vacation time would be less than that. So we wanted to make sure, but it will come via email to that organization. And we will also probably announce things in UC Access, et cetera, but it is going to come directly to whomever has been provided to us as the key contact for the Gateway to Better Network. So if that person leaves, then someone will need to notify us that we now have a new key contact. Will the payers you are looking to connect with be state specific? They could be. They Well, they could be in that a self-insured may be state specific. So I use the example of, you know, what if we brought you a school district, for example, in the state of Florida that is self-insured? We would then notify this is really Florida teachers, employees, bus drivers, whatever it might be, coverage. But we also have to remember they vacation in New York City or they vacation here. So we would try and identify that there could be some regional things um, but, you know, we'll, we would also have the opportunity, and I think the benefit of this network is it really has the potential, assuming our members sign up for it, it has the potential to be a nationwide network, which I think is very powerful. What if we want to provide telemedicine? That is actually part and parcel of some of the people that we are speaking to are also looking for telemedicine options. Uh, we would just present it that way. So once again, as we say, it has to be a right fit, that type of thing. If they're looking for telemedicine as an option, that would be in the profile saying whether it's mandatory that there's a, um, a you know, telemed service provided or is an optional that would allow people to say, I want in or I want out. But yes, I think that will be uh, part and parcel of some of the things that we're seeing in the future. Is there an administrative fee from UCA? There is not. This is a member benefit. So tied to that question, do I have to be an organizational member or can I be an individual member? It does need to be an organizational member because, I mean, we are sending patients to the organization itself. For the leasing, is the reimbursement delineated in the agreement? Yes. That would be in the sub-agreement uh, sub that you would receive that you would be opting in or opting out of would clarify. And as I said, you know, one group that we're speaking to right now wants you to name your price, um, but that would be then in that agreement, that would be populated in that agreement. Okay, if there are standard UNC fees, what is the base that is endorsed by Gateway to Better? UNC fees? U and C. U and C. Oh, um, normal is this normal and customary N and C. Well, anyhow, I don't actually what, how are we determining the pricing? We we certainly right. would counsel people coming to us that I think there has to be some baseline level of pricing, or they are it is not going to get any traction. People are going to opt out of it. Um, but once again, the pricing is one of the options. Then for you to say, you know what I it is. Um, I can't accept that pricing or, you know, I, I have enough patients coming in at my door at a higher price point, so I want to opt out of this Laurel, particular one. You just cut out there um, a moment ago. So you could just back up a little oh, bit I'm, on your response. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So 
Did, would, did you not hear? Because you cut out on me right then, Callie. I would probably just repeat your response. Okay. Um, we would counsel those who are coming to us for a sub-agreement through the network in terms of what we think are realistic pricing expectations across the country, that we would say to them, you know, organizations are likely to opt out if that is your price point. So we want to make sure that, you know, at least they're coming in at pricing that would be um, competitive and accepted by the network. So hopefully we would do some of that for you, but even if, you know, you happen to be in an area where the price point is much higher, then you would be able to say, you know, I would like to opt out of that or or at least control, you know, the number of patients that I am that are coming in my door at that particular price point. We have already signed up for the Gateway to Better. Do we need to resend the application? No. If you have already signed up, we should have that information in the system. And thank you for doing how that. How beneficial would this be for a pediatric urgent care? I think this depends on the types of patients we pursue. To be able to say, once again, that we have a national network of pediatric urgent cares, that is something that you know we would like to highlight in some of the communications that we send out. Because I think that, too, in and of itself, is a sub-type um, uh, marketing opportunity for us of the network itself. But if these are commercial self-insured that are being pursued, they are obviously covering family members in many cases, in which case that's why it's important to us to know whether we have pediatric urgent cares out there that we can then market to that group saying they're pediatric specialty urgent cares within this organization um, and this is where you want to take your kids. What are the geographic locations, state or regions, of the current secured opportunities? That because the secured opportunity that we have is Health in Motion Network, is that we actually have a contract with them, where other ones the contracts are in the works right now, um, that would be nationwide because when you think about the industries that they want to pursue, such as the trucking industry, which is why I think they call themselves Health in Motion Network, um, that's, you know, these people are traveling across the country. If we have an Ahmed specific center, can they be included as location? Absolutely, because, you know, we would like to pursue some, you know, workers comp occupational medicine type contracts. One person actually approached me a year ago, which got me thinking about this national network again. And she said, you know, we're a large construction company. We send people teams all over the country, depending on where the work is. I try and send them, you know, I, I have an injured worker. I look up on the internet at the closest urgent care. One says they do Ahmed. I send my urgent care worker there. And then they say, no, we really don't take Ahmed anymore. So there was a certain element of frustration there, you know, which is why we want to make sure we keep our profiles updated. But yes, we would market this to both, you know, the self-insureds as well as the work comp industry. If our pricing is higher, are we given the opportunity to reduce our initial pricing submission? I assume you're speaking about the name your own price opportunity, and yes, that that would be fluid. You know, if you set your price at one and then you find out the competition in the market is, you know, a, a lower price point and you want to readjust yours, yes. Excellent. That appeared to be all of the questions that we have. Oh, wait, I have another one. <laughs> we have 20 urgent cares in our organization. All, fun all function under individual names and separate tax IDs. Do I need to fill out the application 20 times? We would need a profile on all 20, um, and I think the profile would probably, if they're 
different because they have different tax ID numbers and that type of thing. I think it comes to governance. If there's a management agreement with all of those, it's probably a separate discussion, but it may just be one parent agreement with profiles then of the other uh, centers. And I will make sure to reach out to this um, questioner at the end of this okay. webinar. Great. Okay, we do have a few more minutes. If anyone has any additional questions that you might want to plug in right now, we can go ahead and get those answered. In the meantime, I'll go ahead and kind of give you my closing summary here, just in case anyone wants to give a few moments to type something up. The UCA has developed a Certified Urgent Care Management Professional, or CUCMP, curriculum to serve as the next step in the development and advancement for our urgent care managers. The CUCMP program offers not only higher level courses, but a designation once completed. Don't forget we're offering the summer school promotion where the CU CMP application is almost 75% off. That's $50 for members and $100 for non-members using the promo code CUCMP SUMMER, S-U-M-R. Visit the website for more information or send an email to CUCMP at UCAOA.org with any questions. I do have a few more questions here. How soon can we expect some contracts? I think, well, the health in motion contract, as I said, is, you know, we have signed that, we can get that out of there. I think it comes to, in their world, it is a little bit more traditional. So they have to work with enrollment periods for when people, self-insureds in particular, are their enrollment period. And we know most enrollees, it's January 1. Um, there are some, you know, that are October 1, and, you know, they, they vary somewhat, but most health plans start up January 1. The other group that we're speaking to, and I think relatively close in terms of um, bringing patients to uh, where you name your own price, who are cash pay patients, I think that one is imminent, um, and we would like to think that, you know, we could have that in place within the next 45 days. And others can be more quickly. As I, I said, there's there's um, three other groups that we're in conversations with right now. They could move quickly as well. Okay. Becoming a member of the Gateway to Better Network, what would this do for my center or organization? Is there some kind of credential I would receive once I join the network? I think the biggest benefit is the opportunity to be, you know, a participant in the Gateway to Better Network, which is kind of an exclusive network um, of, uh, you know, you're a member of the Urgent Care Association, you're a member of this network that we then go out and market. But, you know, hopefully the biggest opportunity, it, it's it's not um, perhaps associated with, for, for example, our accreditation program where you've, you know, met all of these criteria for scope, safety, quality, but it certainly is saying, you know, this is one of the um, individuals who has participated and is uh, delegated credentialing to them, and they have agreed to abide by these specific criteria that we have outlined in this contract. We certainly will go out and we personally will market the network and those individuals who are in it. I have one more question here. Will companies know we offer both urgent care and primary care services? That would be in your profile where we're asking questions specific to your scope. If you offer dual services, we would certainly want that there because I think some, and, and this is the beauty again, you know, so many traditional commercial insurers are leaving urgent care centers out of being able to provide anything other than episodic care. And if the urgent care chooses and wants to be able to provide some of the services that extend beyond episodic care and do more disease management or wellness or those types of things, that comes out in the profile that we'd be presenting to the organizations and gives us good data too when other people approach us about you know certain situation in terms of who really is pre um, providing more of a hybrid model. Okay, that appears to be all of our questions for today. A reminder that you will receive an email 
tomorrow from Nicole Van Mersbergen with a copy of the, re the recording of the Gateway to Better uh, webinar. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to answer any questions you have on the Gateway to Better. Our next CUCMP webinar is available on Thursday, July 25th. It is on telemedicine with Dr. Bill Lewis, and attendees are able to earn live CUCMP credit. Thank you to Laurel and to all of you for attending. Please remember to complete the evaluation when you exit, and let us know if you have any additional questions. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.